how much of you is alive or how much of you is dead inside? No, I'm not asking about psychologically, I mean physically. Do you know that at any point of time a little bit of your body is dying and that it's helping you be alive? Every second some cells in the body die and new cells are formed. So are you really you or is your body being gradually replaced or should I say renewed? I'll give you an example. Suppose you have built a wooden structure and whenever you repair it you change a piece of its wood. Over time all parts of the structure have been replaced by a new one making it a whole new thing. Or does the thing remain the same with only parts renewed? An idea remains that when we repair and renew things it becomes a whole new thing. Or if we choose to consider the whole structure bigger than its pieces, we only say that its pieces are changed. Like a flowing river remains the same but the water is different than what it was a few minutes ago. Or the body remains the same while parts of it keep changing. There are roughly 30 to 40 trillion cells in our bodies of which nearly 330 billion cells are getting replaced every day. This means around 300 million cells die every minute. Doesn't that fact blow your mind? However, not every cell of your body dies and regenerates at the same pace. Some cells do not die at all and others have died even before you were born. These were the cells that helped you grow while you were still in the womb but weren't required upon birth. Like the cells that helped you grow bones for your middle ear or your webbed finger cells which died after you were in the womb for eight months. Well, not all cell deaths are planned by your body. The ones which are are called apoptosis. Another one is called necrosis, which happens due to a lack of blood flow. But where do these dead cells go? Cells on the surface of our body or in the lining of our gut are shed off and discarded. Other cells like those inside our bodies are picked up and swallowed by other white cells called phagocytes. But anyway, your cells are dying and they regenerate and that happens in a really beautiful way such that your body doesn't even feel the death inside. Just like your vehicle or your house, maintenance is required and parts are being replaced to keep it running. Coming back to our body, we have so many different varieties of organs like the eyes, ears, heart, liver, etc. Not all of these organs require fast regenerative cells. As we've spoken about earlier, not all cells die and regenerate at the same pace. We have around 200 different kinds of cells in our bodies, but the ones that live the longest are the neurons. These neurons are the ones that give us the memory we have and the reason for our cognitive behavior. Making these cells die frequently would mean losing so much of what we know and have learnt. That would really mess up everyone and everything. So yeah, these cells are kind of immortal and many thanks to that. But this also means that damage to these cells is hard to repair. Now you know why brain and spinal injuries are many times irreversible. However, there is one little part of the brain which does have the ability to regenerate. This part of the brain, called the hippocampus, helps in the ability of learning and memory. This interesting fact was discovered during the 1950s and 1960s nuclear tests when people having been exposed to this were found to have radioactive carbon present in the hippocampal part of the brain. This is only possible if the process of cell regeneration of a part takes place. It takes around 20 to 30 years for regeneration. Another very important organ of your body is the heart, and making it even a bit unstable is too risky. You know how hard it is to get that fat off your body or build up muscles? Well, these two are the kind of cells that can last for years or even decades, and the longest muscle cell life is that of the heart. So the brain has the continued supply of blood and you could get stable blood pressure. However, the heart endothelial cells get replaced every 10 years while heart muscle cells stop growing at 10 years old. The liver, which helps in cleansing your body, replaces its cells in around 300 to 500 days. Our body's fat storage cells are replaced in 10 years. While our colon gets replaced every 5 days, the internal intestinal cells take around 16 years to get replaced. Our skeleton will take around 10 years to be regenerated. Blood. We lose blood cells too. The main function of the red blood cells is to carry oxygen to organs and tissues and bring back carbon dioxide, which makes up about 50% of the blood volume. These cells last up to 120 days. On the other hand, white blood cells last only a few hours and make up for 1% of the total blood volume. We lose a lot of blood cells, 
somewhat 86% of all the cells that we lose over a few months. While there are obvious cell growths like shedding the dead skin cells or constant regeneration of nail and hair cells, there are few cells that are pretty much the same since birth, like the lens of the eyes or the visual cortex. Our skin cells tend to get replaced every 39 days. Have you ever noticed that you cut your fingernails more than your toenails? That's because your toenails grow at a rate of 1 mm per month, while your fingernails grow at 0.1 mm per day, three times faster than your toenails. Up until now, you must be thinking that every part, every tiny part of the body is alive, but that's not the case. A few of our body parts, like hair, nail or bones, aren't live cells. Then we have the liquid stuff outside the cellular membrane, like the plasma, mucus or even tears. It forms around 25% of the body mass. These aren't made of cells, but made by cells, and we cannot say that these are alive. Even the red blood cells do not have any mitochondria or nucleus, so should we consider them as live cells? So the non-live cells keep us alive, right? For instance, the ligaments which keep the bones together are just webs of protein and other stuff. Even these aren't live cells. Another aspect of this is a lot of things depend on person to person. For example, a healthy liver would have around 240 billion cells, whereas a not-so-healthy liver would have only around 172 billion cells. But this doesn't mean that the other person is not alive. Now, surely fewer live cells in an organ makes you less healthy. A human body that is alive is also home to millions of bacteria and microbes. These are found on the skin, in the nose, mouth and especially in the gut. We acquire these bacteria during birth and the first years of life, and they live with us throughout our lives. They don't just live here because we got a free home, but also because we need them. The human microbiota is involved in healthy growth, protecting the body from invaders, helping digestion and regulating moods. But where do we get these bacteria from, and how did we become a home for so many microorganisms? Well, we begin to be colonized by bacteria during birth. During the birth process and immediately after birth, we get our first microorganisms. Babies get microorganisms from their mums during delivery. All babies also acquire bacteria from the skin of the nurses and medical doctors and the environment they live in. After babies begin to eat, they get microbes from their diet. As babies grow, they get microorganisms from the solid food they eat, from crawling on the floor, from putting their hands in their mouths, from licking toys and many other sources. The microbes that live in the human body change during our growth until we are three years old. At that point, the microbiota becomes more or less stable until adult life. Each individual has his or her microbiota, which depends in part, but not only, on the types of food eaten, the environment where the person lives, and the other people and animals that the person interacts with. The microbes of the skin, mouth and nose help in keeping the pathogens out and not make us sick. The intestinal microbiota even help us in producing vitamins, such as vitamins B12 and K. They also help in the digestion of food and protect the intestinal walls from invasion by pathogens. Do you remember the last time you took antibiotics? Does that make you any less alive? Let's find out. Though the majority of the microbes are harmless and even help us remain healthy, sometimes they may be harmful. For instance, bacteria that live on the skin may become a problem in case you get a cut. In such cases, the bacteria might be able to enter your body through the cut, getting in where they do not belong. In this instance, these bacteria sometimes might be harmful to the body and trigger an infection. So, eating antibiotics helps, but it may harm other bacteria as well. More than a thousand different types of bacteria exist in the human gut, but a little imbalance in that may cause sickness or worse. This is another example of how these microbes help us to be alive. Abnormal diversity in the intestinal microbiota may also play a role in the development of obesity, diabetes, asthma or pain in the intestine. So basically, not just our cells, but also the microbes living inside of us is what make us alive and it's very important for us to take care of both of them. Basically, it's super important for us to be healthy because millions of cells and millions of bacteria are working together to keep us alive and healthy. We at least owe it to them to provide a healthy environment. We, of course, need the balanced and diverse microbiota for ourselves. On the question of whether our body becomes a new one over the years, well, not exactly. 
but parts of it are getting replaced and replenished every second. And that's how we are fully alive. What are your thoughts on this, on the miracle that the human body is? Are you going to take care of this body even more now that you know all these facts? Let us know in the comments below.